Happy Monday. Even though it wasn't a happy Sunday night. It's a happy game. I mean, at least it was, you know, their defense sucked. Marshall sucked. The halftime show sucked. Everything about it sucked. No, their defense just didn't show up. Their defense was just a ball. Yeah, but they would have got it. It was holding anyway, but it it was never called. So today we're finishing up our first unit. We're looking at function inverses, right? So means your first test is going to be posted today after class. All right, no, I have it right here. Can I ask a dumb question? So the test is going to be posted. Mm-hmm. Now, this will be done through honor lock. Nope. I guess. Okay, so it's just a matter of. Is it open book? Mm-hmm. So it's basically submit it like you submit the homework, like you can. It's on Teams, yep. Yeah. So it's not an open stacks. No. no. I'll go over it when at the end of class when All I right. post it. Okay. Should have brought my computer. Speaking of, if you haven't done so already, So a few students haven't completed the first three assignments. So if you haven't done so already, make sure you do that. Are we going to be due on that Tuesday before Wednesday's class? What? Homework assignments. We had one that was due yesterday. I'm not talking about that homework. The very first three, the agreement, the pledge, and the survey. Those need to be done ASAP. Uh, my email never got a invite to the teams. I've emailed you a couple times about that. But How are you emailing me? Uh, for my personal. Account. That's why. Huh? Personal, the personal emails don't go through. Anything external, I delete immediately. Yeah, for security reasons, I just delete them immediately. I don't open any external emails. Because right now I asked the ones down there that I should buy. So. Oh, you tell them that you're going to need it. Yeah. And I'll also get in touch with them. See me after class. I'll write down your information. I'll get in touch with them. I'll also email my boss, the chair. And have her contact them as well. There's no homework extensions, right? Because on the My Open Math, there's like a late pass you can use. That's an extension. That's an extension. You can use it. <laughs> it would be advised it extends it by one week of the original due date. Yeah, yeah, yeah I got that. I was just. Because on the actual Teams app, it still says turn it late, which I. That's fine. I get. Ignore that. Because if you have a screenshot, that means that the score counts. So just ignore what it says on Teams. Inverse functions is the discussion for today. I think also this is where one to one was defined. Now, why is that important? Only one-to-one functions have inverses. So if function is not one-to-one, it does not have an inverse function. So what is an inverse function? Well, layman's terms, it's a function that undoes it's quote unquote inverse. So F and F inverse, if you composite them in any order, you just get X back. So X cubed and cube root of X are inverses. 
X squared and square root of X technically are not. Because right? X squared is not one to one, so it doesn't have an inverse function. So verifying functions are inverses. Just composite them in both directions. Right, so here what we're going to do is we're going to take f of g and g of f. You have to get x in both directions. So remember composite functions. What we're doing is doing f of x plus 3 over 2. All right, so 2 times x plus 3 over 2 minus 3. Two over two, obviously one, right? So they're going to drop out. Left with x plus three, then minus three. And three minus three is zero, and we're left with x. G of f. Plug 2x plus uh, 2x minus 3 in everywhere there's an x and f, right? Numerator, we have a minus 3 and a plus 3. That's 0. So I'll leave it with 2x over 2. And that simplifies down to x. So they're inverses. And there's a useful, so there's an interesting property of inverse functions. All right, so since we already established F and G are inverses, the domain of F is equal to the range of G. The range of F is the domain of G. So the domain and range flip roles for its inverse. X squared plus three, X is greater than or equal to zero. Root X minus three for X greater than or equal to three.
Now, this is important. X squared plus three is not technically one to one. So it wouldn't have an inverse. However, notice that they restricted the domain. It's x squared plus three for x squared than equal to zero. For x squared than equal to zero, now that's one to one. So it will now have an inverse. X is greater than equal to 3, which means G of X is defined. Take the square root of a value and then square it. Right, so the square root of 2 and then squared is obviously just 2, right? That first term just becomes x minus 3. Now add 3, right? You get minus 3 plus 3, which is 0. And you're left with x. G of f. G of x squared plus 3. Get the square root of x squared plus 3 minus 3. That is just the square root of x squared. Which is the absolute value of x. which is just x because we're only considering x greater than or equal to zero. So this pair of functions are also inverses. Right. You said x was x squared. It can't be an inverse if it goes by itself. But because we're uh, greater than or equal to zero, it's right allowed here. Right, because otherwise, by itself, what would happen here? It'd be x. Right, you'd have one or the other, which is not a function. Right. Inverse functions are unique. Right. So remember to be an inverse, you have to get X when you composite them. So if it was, so if it was all real numbers, you would stop at absolute value of X. Well, that's not X, right? So it would fail the definition. But because it's greater than or equal to zero, we can say yes. So it was greater than or equal to any other number. No, it could be. I could say x is greater than or equal to eight, right? But that's still greater than zero, so the absolute value just becomes x again. Now, if it was greater than or equal to negative one, let's say, it wouldn't work. Right, because now you have both the negative and the positive, so you have to keep absolute value of x. Does that make sense? Yeah. One, 
Why are you opening? I don't want you. Thank you. Negative square root four minus x and four minus x squared. So we have for the first one, x is less than or equal to four. The second one, x is less than or equal to zero. Again, technically four minus x squared is not one to one if you consider all real numbers. Since we're only dealing with the non-positives, it is one to one. So f of g, let me do f of 4 minus x squared. Four minus four is zero. We're left with negative root x squared. Which is negative absolute value of x. But x is less than or equal to zero. So the absolute value of x becomes negative x. So that checks out. But wait a minute. Yes. I plugged in G of X, right? So we use that one. Wasn't this the definition, though? Yeah, so it's just negative x. It's not negative negative x, right? There's a negative out here. Right, right. So, so absolute value of x, because x is less than or equal to zero, becomes negative x. Oh. Right, so it's negative from the outside, then replace absolute x with negative x. But why? It's negative x if x is less than zero. We have less than or equal to zero. According to the definition, equal to zero should be positive x, shouldn't it? So why am I just saying it's negative x? Because of the negative outside the square root. Why, why why would it be like negative negative x and positive x? That's what I'm asking. That's what you think it would be, right? Because if it equals zero, absolute value of x spits out x, not negative x. It's because the absolute value actually has two definitions. What's negative zero? Still just zero. Absolute value has a second definition. Spits out x if x is greater than zero or negative x if x is less than or equal to zero. They are the same thing. So 
So at zero, you can replace absolute with either X or negative X, depending on which situation fits your needs most. Yep, that's why I'm using negative X here, because that suits my needs more. Now, of course, that only works because negative zero is zero. Honestly, any function that's continuous at that point. But the idea of continuity, you don't study in depth until calculus. Now for G of F, right? So in F, uh, sorry, in G, replace X with negative root four minus X. So X being less than equal to four, of course, that means that square root of four minus X is defined. Doesn't that just become four minus the quantity of four minus X? Four minus four is zero, negative negative X. So these again are inverses. Why does the negative cancel out? Oh, because of square root. Uh, what negative? The negative in front of the square root. Because you're squaring it. Squaring. Yep. Here's another piece of advice that not all students seem to use, let's say. Oops. I'm on the wrong screen. I want to be on this screen. Notice the instructions say show the pair of functions are inverses. That means they are. Right? I'm, I'm implicitly telling you they are inverses. You need to verify it. So if you do your work and you wind up with them not being inverses, you did your work wrong. Countless times in my linear algebra class, I'll tell them to prove something and then in the work they'll say it's not true. And then I just laugh because I say, well, I told you it was, I told you to prove it. I could also have said, are the pair of functions inverses? Right, well, in that case, they're not necessarily right. So do your work, and if you find out you don't get x, then you're done. They're not inverses. So read the instructions. I could have also said, are the pair of functions inverses? Right. Notice I'm now asking you if they are or they aren't. So that's essentially a true false, right? There's no such thing as true false in mathematics. Right. The question is like, is, is so in this case, are they inverses? And you just say yes or no. 
That's like one out of 10, if you're right. You must always support your answer. So if they are, you're gonna tell me why they're in verses. Well, the work shows that they're in verses, right? If they're not, again, you have to explain to me why they're not. The work would be that explanation. I would be if we didn't get X. So. Right, so let, let's say you get negative X for one of them. They're not inverses. Right, and you could just say not inverses because F of G does not equal X. Right, boom, you're done. And I'm pretty lenient with the partial credit. If your algebra is wrong and you, let's say they are supposed to be inverses and you doesn't say show, right? It says, are they? And somehow you did your algebra and you got one of them to be negative X. And then you tell me that they're not inverse because of that negative X. You'll get credit for interpreting your work correctly. And then you lose credit for the algebra being wrong. So you won't lose like all the credit because not only was your algebra wrong, you got the wrong answer. And then I'll say you got the right answer based on your work. What we're going to do here is show the function is one to one and then find its inverse. Okay. One to one function means that each element of the domain, oh, I'm sorry, each element of your codomain has at most one element from the domain mapped to it. Right, remember, codomain doesn't have to be fully covered. Right, so not every element in the codomain has to have something mapped to it. But to be one to one, you can only have one element of the domain mapped to each element in the codomain. That's why x squared is not one to one, right? Negative two and positive two both map to four. What we want to do to show that a function is one-to-one -one is use the formal definition of one-to-one. -one. And I won't rewrite it out because it's in the video. But it says a function f is one-to-one -one when x1, I'm sorry, f of x1 equals f of x2 implies x1 is equal to x2. Right, so if you plug in two values to a function and you get that their outputs are equal, then what you plugged in better be the same. Well, that's what we're going to do here. That means such that. I'm too lazy to write out such that. So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, well, let x1 and x2 be two values such that f of x1 is equal to f of x2. The goal is to show that this logically means or it is necessary that x1 equal x2. Well, if f of x1 equals f of x2, that means 4x sub 1 minus 1 equals 4x sub 2 minus 1, right? But this implies 4x1 would have to equal 4x2. Add 1 to both sides. 
But that implies that x1 has to equal x2, right? Divide both sides by 4. We've now shown it is necessary for x1 to equal x2. It satisfies the definition and hence is one to one. So this function is one to one. That means it has an inverse. We have to find the inverse. Step one, rewrite it. As y equals the function definition. Step two, solve for x. Step three, and I do this in, conjunc in conjunction with writing out the inverse definition. Switch the roles of X and Y. So F inverse of X is X plus one over four. What we're doing in this process, since we know it's one to one, we're choosing some value y in the codomain. We want to find the specific x that maps to it, and we know that such a unique x exists because it's one to one. I'm sorry, real quick, could you? What exactly is the codomain again? Codomain is what the function maps to. So it's the so it's it's the set of possible values that the function could spit out. How does that not the range? Range is the values it does spit out. So I could theoretically say the square root of x has a domain of greater than or equal to zero, right? Yeah. And a codomain of all real numbers. But its range is not negative real numbers, right? Again, greater than or equal to zero. But I can say its codomain is all real numbers. Because Cause that's just how codomain is defined. You take a square root of real number, you get a real number, right? So yeah. I can say the codomain is just all real numbers even though it's not its range. So it's a, that does play an important role. The distinction does play an important role in theory. So when you, if you um, study functional analysis, the difference between codomain and range becomes very important. For purposes of this course, I very rarely will just talk about range. Just switch the roles of y and x. Yeah. All right, so once you solve for x, just now flip them, right? y becomes x, x becomes y. And then you can write your inverse definition, which I just typically do right off the bat. Yeah, that means inverse. And again, that is also very confusing until you get used to it because if I write this, this actually means f of x squared. But this 
does not mean one over f. It means the inverse of f. Because that's how we defined it. No, we just I the, the the idea probably is because um, of the idea of multiplicative inverses. Right, so the multiplicative inverse of two is two to the minus one, which is one half. That's probably why they came up with this notation. Uh, but that's the only way to write it, that it's an inverse. Yes. Unless you specifically define a new function like we did up here, G, and say explicitly G is the inverse of F. Right, whereas if I write it this way, this is now implied that that's the inverse of our given function f. Right, so if I give you a function g and I gave you g inverse, that means that g and g and that g inverse are inverse functions. Again, that's important in theory purposes. Two over x plus three. Yeah, remember, first thing we have to do is show that this function is one to one. So again, we're going to pick two arbitrary values such that f of x1 is equal to f of x2. Now we have to show that that necessarily means that we pick the same value. So this would mean 2 over x1 plus 3 is equal to 2 over x2 plus 3. Okay. How would you solve this? One way to do it. It's a longer way. It's another way to do it. Again, it's a longer way. Notice that the numerators are equal. In order for the fractions to be equal with equal numerators, the denominators must also equal. So I can just immediately skip to saying that the two denominators must be the same. Which, by the way, is a quick way of saying um, two ways. You can either take the reciprocal and then multiply both sides by two or divide both sides by two and then take the reciprocal. Both ways will lead you to the exact same statement, which is x1 plus three has to equal x2 plus three. And again, cross multiply. You'll get two x1 plus three, uh, two x2 plus three rather is equal to two x1 plus three, divide both sides by two. You now have x2 plus three equals x1 plus three, which is the exact same statement. So because the two denominators are the same? Because the numerators are the same. Right. It would be the same thing if the denominators were the same, then the numerators would also have to be the same in order for the two fractions to be equal, right?
Subtract both sides by three, you get x1 equals x2. And hence our function is one to one. Meaning it is guaranteed to have a unique inverse. Because that definition is an if and only if. So if you know a function has an inverse, then you know it's one to one. If you know it's one to one, then you know it has an inverse. There are no one to one functions that do not have an inverse. Now we have to find it. All right, so we pick an arbitrary value in the range. The idea is you need to find that unique element in the domain that maps to it. I'm going to do two steps at once here. I'm going to multiply both sides by x plus 3 and at the same time divide both sides by y. Now remember, we're trying to solve for x. Subtract both sides by 3. That gives us x is 2 over y, all minus 3. You can keep it in this form. Uh, you said you um, times both sides by x plus 3, and then yep. you divided it by y? Yeah. So essentially what I did is I multiplied both sides by x plus 3 over y. Yep. Good. Forget where I heard it from, but one of my favorite phrases is, I can't be held responsible for giving you the wrong answer if you don't ask me the right question. Now, if you wanted to write this as an, like an inverse function, like what g of x will, would it then turn back into 2 over x minus 3? Oh, um, inverse. Right, yeah. So, because now, remember, the last step is to switch the roles of x and y. So it become, oh, right. So it becomes 2 over x minus 3. Or... Two minus three x all over x. If you want to combine the fractions, either answer is acceptable. And again, it's important to note that on a test, I might, you know, ask, I might say, given f of x equals blah, find, and then write that f inverse, right? That does not mean I want 1 over f, right? That means I want its inverse function. And I could be evil and say, find the inverse function when no inverse actually exists. All right, so the first thing you should always do is verify that the given function is one to one. Because if it is not, you're done. There is no inverse. Are you going to show us one more is not one to one? No. You, what you would do is you'd wind up getting that x1 does not necessarily have to be x2. 
I'm, see, I'm just trying to visualize when that would be. So for this one, let's just say I don't include X is greater than equal to zero. You get X1 squared equals X2 squared. Does That does not mean X1 has to equal X2. <laughs> right? Their absolute values are equal, but you could have two and negative two, yeah. and their absolute values are still equal. So that's what I mean by they that necessarily don't have to be the same. In which case you would just go not to one, not one to one, therefore no inverse exists. And that would be your answer to that question. So here, because we're told specifically that X is greater than equal to zero, I'm going to say let X1 and X2 be greater than equal to zero. The values such that f of x1 equals f of x2. Just means where? Which one? B values where? Such that. Okay, so again, notation. That means x sub one quantity squared, right? X sub one is the variable. Add nine to both sides. So one dollar fee for every nanosecond you're late. Oh, and by the way, that's my light fee. Right now, this is where I had said before, right? We have x1 squared has to equal x2 squared. Which doesn't automatically mean x1 and x2 are the same. Because we take the square root of both sides, right? And then we get absolute value of x1 has to equal the absolute value of x2. Which again does not mean x1 is, is equal to x2. But we stipulated that these both have to be greater than or equal to zero because that was our domain. Then by the definition of absolute value, that means that x1 is equal to x2. And I say because x1, x2 are greater than or equal to zero. So this function is one to one. That should be more specific. This function with the given domain is one to one. But what you need to do is, when we talk about functions, each function has to have a domain. So when we talk about a function, we always are talking about its domain as well. So when I say this function is one-to-one, -one, I'm including the domain without explicitly saying for x greater than equal to zero. So if I define, let's say, g of x equals x squared minus 9 for x less than 0, they are by definition two different functions because they have two different domains. What am I doing? We have to find the inverse now. I'm just getting ready to move on. We pick 
some value in the range y, we have to find now the unique element x in the domain. We'll add nine to both sides. Right. Now take the square root. So uh, square root of y plus nine has to equal the absolute value of x. But that means that x is the square root of y plus nine, right? because we know that X has to be greater than or equal to zero. Our inverse function is then the square root of X plus nine. What is the domain? Negative nine to infinity. Oh, okay. Well, you want it's the it's the same thing. You can say that. <clears throat> right, for x greater than equal to negative nine, which is the range of f of x. Wait. Oh, yeah, yeah. You got the negative 9 from looking at the range from the beginning. The negative 9 from y. Looking at the range, basically. Right, so if x is greater than equal to 0, what is the range of f of x? Right, because the smallest value x squared is going to give you is 0, right? So negative nine is the largest value you can get. Because if now increase, so again, a number minus nine, if you start to increase that number, you increase. So negative, negative nine is the smallest. Negative nine is the smallest yeah. value that F can give you. Because again, you're increasing the value of X squared, which means if you take larger and larger numbers minus nine, the result is going to get larger and larger. And that's another way of saying x squared minus 9 is an increasing function using a terminology from, what was it, the second lesson? Well, it's increasing from 0 and up. But it's still increasing. No. Oh, no. No, if it's less than, yeah, it'd be decreasing, but I'm only considering greater than equal yeah. to 0. Okay, so again, we're given a restricted domain, so we're going to pick two arbitrary values, x1 and x2, that are less than or equal to negative 3, such that they are, such that f of x1 equals f of x2. That means such that. Subtract four from both sides.
and take the square root. No, I don't want to write that way. I want to write it this way. I'm going to take a little side passage here. Now, x1 being less than or equal to negative 3. Means that x1 plus 3 is less than or equal to 0, right? So then by definition of absolute value, that would mean the absolute value of x1 plus 3 equals negative the quantity of x1 plus 3. And I have to do the same argument with x2. What we say then negative x1 plus 3 has to equal negative x2 plus 3. Right, just replacing the absolute values with what they evaluate out to. Multiply both sides by negative 1. Subtract both sides by 3. And you get x1 is equal to x2. When I'm looking at those, the, the two absolute values, the, uh, the third line down on the screen, where the absolute value x1 plus 3 equals absolute value x2 plus 3, right? Mm -hmm. And all I'm thinking in my head is that x1 is 3 and x2 is negative 9. And you're going to get absolute value of 6 equals absolute value of negative 6, which is true, right? Yes, but x1 can't be 6. Well, no, x, I mean, I'm saying if x1 is 3, I'm sorry, x1 can't be 3. Oh, oh. Because they have to be less than or equal to negative 3. <sighs> okay. Otherwise, yes, you'd be right. Then it wouldn't be 1 to 1, right? Thus, our function is one to one. Now we have to find the inverse. Pick 
pick an arbitrary we're picking an arbitrary y in the range now we want to solve for the unique value x in the domain subtract 4 square root And then use the fact that we've already shown that absolute value of x plus 3 have to be negative the quantity of x plus 3 because x is less than equal to 3, or negative 3 rather. Multiply both sides by negative 1. and then subtract by three. Negative three minus the square root of y minus four is equal to x. So our inverse function would be negative three minus the square root of X minus four. And this would be valid for values of X greater than or equal to four. Right? Because if you look again at the original function, for x being less than or equal to negative 3, the smallest value that, that, uh, that x plus 3 can take on is 0. So the largest value that f of x can give you is 4. Or no, the smallest value. Because right? if you add larger numbers to 4, it gets larger. So since the range is 4 to infinity, the domain of its inverse would be 4 to infinity. Any questions on the inverse of a function? By the way, the inverse function, not only is it unique, it's also one-to-one, -one. guaranteed. Right? Because if you find the inverse of an inverse, so the, yeah, cause the original. it gets you to the original, right? Which means the inverse function has an inverse. 
Pence must be one to one. If I remember correctly, if the original function is on to, then so is its inverse. And OK, and what's the difference between on to and one on to on to means that the codomain equals the range. Right, so the entire codomain is covered by the function. Right, so X squared is not on to. If you say it's from the reals to the reals. But if I now say it's from the reals to the non negative reals, now it's on to. Right, because every non negative real number gets mapped to by X squared. But not every real number gets mapped to by X squared, right? You can't get to negative five. So onto just simply means the entire codomain is the range. So the entire codomain gets covered. Whereas one to one, of course, means that each element of the codomain has at most one element from the domain mapping to it. I say at most because remember, you don't have to map to every element in the codomain. Is it basically looking for like the codomain? Yeah, you, know, you don't have to worry about the codomain. At least not for this course. Because you don't really have to look for a codomain, right? I can essentially say the codomain is anything within reason. I could even say X squared has a codomain of all complex numbers if I really wanted to. Hmm. Why do I have to do this? That was weird. Okay. Okay, seriously, what is going on? Huh? What the? Uh. 
so you can go bye bye. Yeah, it's pretty small size. It's Oh, you're not. OK, so why is this now adjusted? Um, you were up there. I bet I know why he was giving me a hard time. And let's try that again. Still coming over here. I don't know why. I do have Adobe installed on this. Why are none of my one drives open? That is irritating. What's going on with this computer? Thank you. Still kind of small, but I guess. No, oh, it's only a little bit larger than the original test file. The Word document, so that's the right size. That's. So disappointed, none of you have turned it in yet. Oh. First test is now available. All right. So what you do is you come in here, open the test file, right? either download it or open it. You'll complete all of the questions on loose leaf paper. You will then scan your test as a single PDF file. All right, so it's multiple pages, you'll need to create a multiple paged PDF file. I don't want three PDF files uploaded, I want a single one. Notes, textbook, any other official course material, any model calculator that does not have symbolic manipulation capabilities, right? So graphing calculators. 
can't discuss this with anyone. All right. So that means classmates, other instructors. You can obviously talk to me about it, but I'll only answer clarification questions. So like, what does this mean? As long as it's not something I expect you to know, I'll tell you what it is. And you can't talk about it with your friends, family. I think I have in there an aunt who is an engineer but hasn't looked at math in a while. Not a soul. You also cannot Google the answer. Probably going to know if you didn't write the solution. So don't risk it. Because it will be an automatic zero. Assessment will be due by the start of next Monday's class. So you have one week. And then just before you start, just type, you'll just write out the statement. Basically just, you know, saying that, yeah, I'm not going to cheat. I'm only going to stick with what I'm allowed to use. Fairly certain that the new chat bot, the what is it, the chat GPT or whatever it is, doesn't do math yet. So at least I know I don't have to worry about that. Most importantly of all, have fun. I'm not bad even. I just have to go. What's life if you don't have fun with it? This test covers everything we've done so far. So it's all the function definitions. Why is someone asking me what's for lunch? You can go away, thank you. Are there any questions? Review like next class? Nope. Next class, we're going to start with polynomials. Again, I had an instructor that stuck with me as well. One time was asked in class, so are we going to have a review? And the instructor looks and said, if you do your job as a student, you don't need a review. That hit hard. That hit really hard. We also had an instructor walk out during a final and said, if you have to cheat at this level, you should question your life. So that to the entire class. Mind you, this mind you, this was grad school. Again, was was, was asked, you're not going to stay. Make sure we don't cheat. And teachers looked at us and said, if you have to cheat at this stage, you should question your life choices. And then left the room. I think probably is a better thing to say. I know we got this quiz coming, right? Mm -hmm. but can I ask you for a quick example on an absolute value of a quadratic in an inequality? Like absolute value of x plus five, x squared plus five x is less than or equal to ten. So you'd solve it the same way, right? Well, I know, but I, I, I there was one like that on the homework, and I, I just couldn't get it. Just couldn't. But I'm trying to find the, you know, the, I guess the solution set in what was it? The two format. I, the, X squared plus five absolute value, F five X absolute value. I mean, we don't have to add a constant if you don't want. To. I'm not trying to take up time. I just uh, is it less than or equal to uh, fourteen?
And so that'd be the first step, interpretation. Right. <laughs> this is going to be an and a union. No, wait. Yeah. Right. Then you solve each one individually. Yeah, and you end up getting into the quadratic formula. Right. Do you? Well, you wouldn't. Uh, yeah, you would. Yeah, sucks. If it was minus 14, that would be nice. Well, this one is. Oh, all right. So that one will work out with factoring. Should give you what break points, right? Well, so this one. Possibly. You just have to use the quadratic formula, like you said. So is it negative B? Plus minus square root of... B squared minus 4AC. So... Uh, 4 times 56. 14, 56. There's a contradiction. Oh, Oh, right off the bat. Because that's not going to have any breakpoints. So that's going to be... Right, because what's under here is going to be negative, which yeah. means complex, which we don't care about. So that's yeah. not going to have any breakpoints. Doesn't mean it doesn't have a solution. It means it has no breakpoints. And then this is what it's... X minus 7x plus 2. Well, it would have an equal zero. Right, but that's how you find breakpoints. Right. 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 So since there's no breakpoints here, it's only one interval you have to consider the entire domain minus infinity to positive infinity. Positive. Because the breakpoints just break your domain. That's why you find breakpoints. So if there are none, your domain doesn't break off at any point. So you just consider the entire domain, which would be negative infinity to positive infinity, right? All real numbers. Why? But I mean, they're all. But it's all imaginary because of the the radical. Not again. Only for the breakpoints. Right. So that will never equal zero. Okay. But it could, but it could still be positive. It could still be greater than zero. All right. Right. Because remember, it's an inequality we're trying to solve. All right. I'm sorry, everyone. Right. Positive, greater than zero. So all real numbers for that piece. Yeah. Now here. I break up the domain at the breakpoints. Test each interval. So that's what negative times negative, which is positive. Positive times negative, which is negative, and then positive times positive, which is positive. So here we get as our solution. That right. Oh, I'm sorry. Whoops. I'm sorry. You want the negative one. It's less than. Yes, that one's less than or equal to, right? So it's this one here. That says and. That means we want the intersection of these two intervals as our solution. Oh, so it's just two, seven, maybe two, seven. That make sense? Yes. Yes. Thank you. And it'd be similar for it's greater than equal to, right? You just break it into its two inequalities and then solve each inequality separately, and then it's the intersection. Because it has because it's and, right? Both inequalities have to be satisfied simultaneously. That's for less than and greater than. Greater than doesn't look like this. But it's still two inequalities that have to hold, right? Yeah, all right. 
So it'd be it'd do it the exact same way. You'd break it up into its own equalities, solve each one, and at the very end, you take the intersection of the solutions like I just did. Anything else? And by the way, I think this test is very easy, so. Of course, you do. we should the professor. We should all be uh, happy with this test. Okay. Don't wait until the last minute. Do the test. You have seven days to do it. You even just do one question a day, that's five days. Gracias. Wow.